We're trying to create a new system where the people have control over the money and not some like government or some shady group of businessmen or some group of billionaires. Like that, that is what the current system is. So we're trying to create a new system. And I think that that's ultimately something that I think a lot of activists are going to get behind. You're listening to Because of Bitcoin, a podcast that shares the personal stories of how Bitcoin is having a real impact in people's lives, including mine. I'm your host, Mauricio Di Bartolomeo, the co-founder and CSO of Ledin. And without further ado, let's get started with today's story. In 1948, shortly after the devastation of World War II, the United Nations signed the Declaration of Human Rights. However, more than 70 years later, human rights violations persist across a large part of the world. According to the Human Rights Foundation, over 50% of the world's population still lives under authoritarian regimes, and 87% of the world does not have access to stable money. In the last 70 years, the reality for many people is that things have gotten worse. But there's also a growing number of brilliant individuals who fight day and night to bring freedom and rights to the oppressed. Organizations like the Human Rights Foundation are supporting those leading the fight against authoritarian regimes. Their chief strategy officer, Alex Gladstein, is joining me today to share his story and explain why Bitcoin has become so important in the work that he and the Human Rights Foundation are doing. Alex is a featured speaker at leading universities and conferences all over the world, he has published two books on Bitcoin, and his writing has been featured in publications such as Time Magazine, The Washington Post, The New York Times, Wired, and more. I've been fortunate enough to see Alex speak multiple times, and I'm proud to call him a friend. As soon as we decided to create this podcast, I made it a goal to have him on as a guest, and I couldn't be more grateful to start the season with him. Great to see you again. Great to see you, my friend. Doing well. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I've had the pleasure of, of knowing you for, I think, almost four years now. But I guess to start, if you could share a little bit about what your childhood was like and, and where did you grow up? I grew up in a series of towns outside of New York City. I always thought going into the city was uh, kind of intimidating. <laughs> I lived in a smaller, quiet area. I had a very sort of sheltered, privileged upbringing. We didn't have to like lock our doors in our town. I had, I would say, a pretty easy comfortable childhood. I decided to try and go to school in, in Boston, which wasn't that far, to stay a little closer to my family. And that's when I started breaking out a little bit of the mold. I kind of was set on the course I'm on now by by the events that happened when I was uh, in high school. 9-11 happened and, and then my country invaded Iraq. So I was extremely interested in, in why these things happened and, and you know what the second order effects would be. So I went and studied international relations at this school called Tufts University. And I um, was able to take courses at a sort of an, there's like a graduate level IR school that's like inside Tufts called Fletcher. I spent a year in London studying at the School of African and Oriental Studies, where I got to meet a lot of students who had extremely different opinions than the ones at Tufts. Got a chance to work in British Parliament as an assistant to a politician who was working on foreign affairs stuff. And then, uh, was fortunate enough to get an internship at the Human Rights Foundation, you know, maybe a year and a half after it was created. So uh, kind of summer of 2007. I was pushed in the direction of what I do by world events. I wasn't looking for a human rights job, to be honest. I was looking to just be in the sort of international affairs, politics, international politics space. Happened to get this job at HRF, really loved it. So I had this internship at HRF, and then at the end of the summer, they offered me a full-time job, and I happily accepted, and I'm still here 15 years later. One of the things that stood out to me there is you said a lot of your life was impacted by world events, and you mentioned 9-11 and, that, and that what happened when you were in high school. Could you share a bit about like what your perspective of the world was like pre-9-11, and it, was there like a particular aspect of it that made you become so passionate about wanting to get involved in, in international politics? Yeah, well, I was very young and very ignorant and shielded. 9-11 was, was pretty intense because I, I knew people who got killed and a lot, a lot of people in the town that I, I grew up in a commuter town. So basically people, dads and moms went to work in the city in the morning on the train and they came home in the evening. So there were a lot of people who were impacted, a lot of families impacted. You know, that made a big impact. And then I, I just saw the changes like to society. 
you know, you had to, uh, you know, have a lot more security when you went on airplanes. I, I definitely felt all of that stuff. As a student, obviously, there was a lot of pushback against the war in Iraq. I, uh, at the time, was on the debate team at high school, and I remember having to. It was interesting. They had us like debate both sides. So I was on stage in front of the whole school and had to debate kind of both sides, which was an inter- interesting. Now looking back at that, so I had to debate oh, why we should invade, which is a, in retrospect insane that you would have a student do that. But I mean, I guess at the time, like it was so mainstream that we would invade, and so many people supported it that like it was seen as proper to do both sides. But in any event, it was quite clear that learning Arabic and learning about the Middle East would become important. Somebody came to one of my classes in high school and talked about Arabic and showed us how it worked a little bit. I was pretty intrigued. So I enrolled in Arabic actually at Tufts and I took it for all four years. I will say I never developed like a serious um, ability to speak, but I did learn a lot about the region and culture, which was kind of the point. That was really interesting because I was exposed to a lot of Arabic film, a lot of Arabic writing, a lot of Arabic movies, art, uh, th- things I just would not have ever experienced had I not you know, taken all that, all that coursework. Especially in London, I had a full course on Islam and democracy where we did a lot of Islamic philosophy and uh, had a lot of students in the course who could recite the whole Quran from memory. I was very interested, yeah, in the whole like war on terror, neocons, like what, why did we invade Iraq? Like I, I did a bunch of coursework on neoconservatism and what led American policymakers choose to, um, to make that choice. There was never really any clear answer, which was really disconcerting, actually. Very bizarre. I, I was definitely pushed into the world of thinking about international relations and international affairs from a very young age as a result of those events and was fortunate enough to have a career path where I could explore those things. I ended up, you know, kind of by happenstance doing the activist stuff, but I've always been able to like be exposed to what I was interested back then through, through the work I do today. As you were going through this, was there a person that you considered a, a role model, like somebody that, you know, a particular field of work or somebody like as you were, as you were going through your university studies and kind of getting all this new understanding for that part of the world and how you wanted to impact change and say politics at that point, uh, was there anybody that you, you looked up to or, or wanted to emulate? Yeah. I mean, for a long time, I wanted to go into political science. I had a, a teacher, a mentor named Tony Smith. He was a prolific writer. Uh, about what you would call liberal interventionism or this sort of strand of American foreign policy where we would intervene in world affairs. And he was like a scholar of that. So he had many books on the topic and he was a a very fierce critic of the war in Iraq. Again, tried to be neutral in teaching it to us, but he was obviously thought it was hugely unethical and, you know, thought a lot of American foreign policy was largely unethical. So it was interesting, you know, learning from him. As a student, you're always trying to like, you know, keep, keep opinion at arm's length and you're trying to develop your own opinion, you know? So you always want to sort of challenge your professors and their beliefs. Like, I I think that's an, uh, maybe it's an American thing, but it's kind of like what, what your classroom environment is designed to do is to be a little combative. That was really interesting learning from him. And I I think it's fair to say that I, I now have a lot more appreciation for his, his work maybe today than I did maybe 10 years ago. I think there's a lot of subtle nuance in this field, you know, because there's kind of this Cold War mentality of like the U.S. versus all the dictators, right? Which, which is kind of like my, that was sort of like my initial starting point in this field, you know, 10 years ago, let's say. But it's interesting doing journalism and, and trying to look at um, m- money, actually, and monetary policy worldwide, and this all being inspired by Bitcoin has opened my eyes and uh, showed me a lot of things. And I now have like a much more nuanced opinion uh, about, you know, why societies thrive and why some others don't. Part of it certainly is dictatorship versus democracy or open societies versus closed. And, and I, I'm grateful for that foundational knowledge. But then on top of that, or next to that is also kind of like core periphery imperialist dynamics, like where you have these rich countries that that feed off of these poor countries. And this is real. And this is extremely deep. People would, you know, people dispute, you know, which is the bigger reason why the West is successful. Most people would just say it's because of, 
you know, these like traits that we developed since Protestantism that, that we have individual rights and individuality and entrepreneurialism and all this stuff. And that that's fair. That's a factor for sure. It's just like, <laughs> it's a lot of it's imperialism too and colonialism. So uh, I, I, I came back to that kind of in my late, like recently in the last five years. And I think it's very important to hold both ideas in your head in terms of how the world has developed, which is one reason I'm very into Bitcoin um, because it kind of, it's really aligned with both things. Like, I think you want to support individual rights and freedom and you also want to oppose imperialism. So I, I, I think that's only fair, but that's not a very popular point of view, I would say. In my early 20s, I witnessed my home country of Venezuela dismantle its democracy and fall into authoritarianism. And no surprise, the country's economy and society sank with it. We did not go down without a fight, though, and the fight still goes on to this day. Organizations like the Human Rights Foundation supported many Venezuelan activists then and still supports them today. Can you share a bit about the work that you do with the Human Rights Foundation or what the Human Rights Foundation does uh, for someone that may not be so familiar with it? I started working at HRF in 2007. Uh, I've worked on a series of programs over the years. I, I was involved in our Cuba work early on, which supported the underground library movement. I was very involved with our North Korea programs for a long time, which focused on sending information inside North Korea where they have no internet. I was very involved with the Oslo Freedom Forum, which is a conference that you just attended in Norway, which is like a gathering of dissidents and activists from around the world. And it, it's an attempt to help them tell their story in an engaging way and then like link them with uh, people from different fields like policy, philanthropy, uh, economics, uh, art, music, and to see how we can help them in their struggle. And it's uh, a deeply meaningful event, I, I think, and very inspiring. And I'm very proud of all of the stuff we've done. We have a lot of other programs we do. Um, and I've had a, kind of an opportunity to be involved in a lot of it along the way. Got to do a lot of writing, journalism, got to do fundraising, marketing, got to do strategy. I, I've done been able to do a lot of things. Today, I, I focus uh, as chief strategy officer on uh, high-level fundraising, high-level strategy, trying to support the program teams. I've also developed like an expertise area in technology and human rights, and more specifically in money and finance and human rights and in Bitcoin. So I spend a lot of my time looking at that. When do you remember? I mean, listen, you're, you're one of, I would argue, the best articulate and hardest working champions of Bitcoin and human rights out there. Do you remember the first time you interacted with Bitcoin? From very early, it was on our radar. Julian Assange spoke at the second Oslo Freedom Forum in person in 2010. Six months later, Satoshi warned the world or warned rather the Bitcoin community that they shouldn't get involved with WikiLeaks or, or that he was he or she was worried about WikiLeaks using Bitcoin, um, that it wasn't ready yet. But regardless, six months later, Julian Assange started raising money in Bitcoin for, for WikiLeaks. 2013, we, we did a fundraiser. So two years later, we did a fundraiser for Ukrainians who were protesting against the regime in Bitcoin. We worked with our chairman, Gary Kasparov, to do that. The next year, we start, in 2014, we started uh, accepting Bitcoin donations. I, I just didn't really take it very seriously, though. Like, I just thought it was this niche thing. Like, I didn't really grasp what was going on. Late 2016, people started really saying, you guys should look at this more closely. So early 2017, we had our first, like, official kind of program at, at one of our events in Oslo, uh, a workshop on Bitcoin human rights. And it kind of all went from there. It was just a crazy time. You had the price movement. It was just wild. I was going through my own educational journey about it. I remember maybe June that year in 17, thinking about incorporating it into one of my talks and then just being like, look, I don't really know enough about this and then, and then not, and I'm grateful I didn't. So, but I spent the next six to 12 months just like pedal to the metal learning every day, reading, just being absorbed. The next year I was just like sold on Bitcoin being just this core piece of the, the human rights a struggle. So over the, last, over the last four to five years, I've been just been pushing that. I doubt that that has always been an easy job, right? I, I, I bet that you've found some challenges and, and some setbacks, I guess, uh, or questions or, or doubtful people. What, what kept you going? Can you recall specifically, is there any one of those particular questions that you found yourself answering five or six times and kind of what kept you going uh, through that? The focus on Bitcoin is, is certainly unique. Maybe not so much today, but, but like 17, 18, like everybody was into blockchain. You had all these like 
just enormous amounts of money wasted by companies and organizations to create their own blockchain. Now, this was usually done waved over or not stated purpose of minting a token so people could get rich. This was just pervasive. This is what people really kind of feasted on and focused on was to- token economics and all that stuff. So that was like such an era where academia, uh, NGOs, governments, they got totally sidetracked from Bitcoin onto this, like, let's create our own blockchain thing. I would say that's that era is probably over. I mean, it still continues to happen, but to a lesser extent, I think that people start to have started to understand that, that, you know, what Bitcoin is in a better sense. Now, they may not like it, but at, at least I think people start to start to understand keeping that focus on Bitcoin because of what it means to me and what it means to the people I work with, because it's so important to have money that nobody can control. And I mean, nobody, I mean, not a small group of people. Like, I, I, I think it's very concerning to me that Ethereum is going to move to proof of stake or is going to try to like that. That seems like not not ideal for for the kind of state resistant technology that we're trying to build here. So we'll see. So you have a general environment now where you've got like Bitcoin has been completely kind of like either submerged or ignored by the establishment, especially in academia, uh, where it's just like blockchain conferences that have maybe like one or two pieces about Bitcoin, but not really. That's what all the kids are learning about. They're not learning about Bitcoin. They're learning about Chainlink or whatever. So it's pretty distressing. So, so at the end of the day, like Chainlink's not going to be around, and Bitcoin will, and 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 it's gonna it's gonna persevere. It's going to survive. It's going to be interesting. Um, it's going to be an incredible tool for people because governments can't stop it, and um, that that's why I continue to be so interested in it. If I thought that governments could stop it easily then I wouldn't be that interested in it. Let's put it that way. All has to do with its, 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 its value as a human rights tool. We're trying to create a new system where the people have control over the money and not some like government or some shady group of businessmen or some, some group of billionaires. Like that, that is what the current system is, right? So that's the fiat system. So we're trying to create a new system. And I think that that's ultimately something that I think a lot of activists are gonna get behind. Because it's just super, it's just based. It's like super activisty to want to create a new monetary system that central bankers and governments can't control. Like that's freaking awesome. The new monetary system that Alex and many others are already building is transparent, accessible by all, incorruptible, and protects property rights. And it is helping many around the world reclaim some of the basic human rights that were often forcefully taken from them. Even though he has dedicated his career to the cause, it isn't always easy to maintain an optimistic outlook. My mission in life is to oppose dictatorship and authoritarianism and fear and to support freedom and open thought and free press. And how do you do that? Well, it's not very easy. It's very distressing and... It oftentimes can be can feel like a failed cause or a fool's errand. I mean, there's a really, really, really good article. I don't know if you read it um, about the Oslo Freedom Forum that came out in Tablet Magazine, and it's 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 depressing. I mean, it's an overview of kind of like the human rights movement and how right now it doesn't look like it's working. Dictators are on the rise. They're kind of just wreaking havoc on the world. You know, that the world is becoming more authoritarian. Um, even in democracies, we've seen everything from financial confiscation in Canada to, you know, all these like insane COVID lockdowns, like all over the place, like, you know, that were then used to to crump, crunch down on political speech. So, you know, no society is like feeling freer, you know, really probably than it, than it was a few years ago with, you know, maybe a couple exceptions. So it's not, it's not super optimistic and you know, a lot of the traditional activist movements have kind of failed or petered out or, you know, whatever, whatever the world was able to do to rally around uh, the cause of fighting against apartheid South Africa. Like they just the world just doesn't have the guts anymore. Like like they're just hopelessly addicted to Russian energy or to Chinese labor or Chinese markets or whatever. And just to be realistic, like they're just they're just weak. I don't think it's going to be political leaders. You know, and activism is important and I'm proud of everything we do, but you know, a lot of times activism is, is virtue signaling. Like, oh, free Tibet on Twitter. Like that's not gonna do anything. Free Venezuela. Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's nice, it's cool. Like it's good, it's not bad, it's good. 
it's not effective. But guess what? You can like teach somebody about Bitcoin and, and meaningfully improve their freedom. Meaningfully for them. Now, if you can do that at scale, now we're cooking with gas. Because at the end of the day, what do dictators need to survive control over the economy? This just takes that right out from under them. So this is why dictators don't like Bitcoin. This is why the CCP banned Bitcoin. This is why Putin just passed the law, signed it himself, preventing Bitcoin from being used as currency in Russia. Um, this is why the Venezuelan government was going around stealing mining equipment from people. This is not something they want. They do not want the, the people to have a digital money that they can't control. And this is why people like us love Bitcoin so much. You've written several books about Bitcoin, My Little Bitcoin Book and Check Your Financial Privilege uh, mm -hmm. most recently. Both are great reads. Could you tell listeners a little bit about your books and what they can find in them? Sure. The Little Bitcoin Book was a project that was uh, completed three years ago in the summer of 2019. I got together with um, seven other Bitcoiners from around the world, from various backgrounds, from from Latin America, actually from Venezuela, from, from Africa, from the former Soviet Union, from Asia, from North America. And we decided to write a book. That's sort of meant just to be like this little book that you would hand out to somebody who doesn't understand what Bitcoin is. It's just meant to be a gentle intro. It's only about 100 pages. It's very light reading. But it, it, it was an attempt to explain why it matters for your finances and for your freedom and for your future. Um, that was really fun. We did it as a collaborative exercise. We wrote the book in four days, living at the same house. Um, really, really enjoyed that. It was a lot of fun. Since then, the book's been translated into more than 20 languages. It's, it's um, sold you know, thousands and thousands of copies. It's been distributed uh, throughout dictatorships um, in su subversive networks. So that book I would consider a success. And then the latest one is Check Your Financial Privilege, which is a collection of writing that I did over the last, basically in 2020 and 2021, as I did two things, I was tracing monetary history and basically how do we go from the gold standard to the dollar standard? Um, and, and what would, you know, is a Bitcoin standard next? Um, and then the other thing, of course, is, is just like, you know, tracing global Bitcoin adoption through the, through the stories of users and, and kind of doing these kind of deep dive pieces on, on Bitcoin adoption through the lens of history and political economy, looking at like places like Palestine, Cuba, uh, West uh, French controlled West Africa, etc. They're both amazing. What I think is so powerful about the one that I'm reading recently, Check Your Financial Privilege, is it, the stories as told by the people in these countries just make it a lot more clear for people to understand what Bitcoin is doing and the actual problems that it's solving. A lot of times people talk about Bitcoin solving problems in this abstract way. I think your book personifies those use cases and gives people tangible examples. And so I, I, you know, we'll, put the, we'll put the links and everything down in the show notes as well for, for people to check them out as, uh, if, if they want to after the show. What is next for the Human Rights Foundation in the next few years? Well, we have the Oslo Freedom Forum in New York coming up, a one-day event that will really give you a sense of what we work on. It'll have some amazing content, performances, talks, uh, really special dinner, celebration, so we'd recommend people go to oslofreedomforum.com and check that out. That's coming up on October 3rd. We're releasing another really large round of, of grants to the Bitcoin ecosystem next week. There's going to be some media on that. I've got two, two pieces of research slash like guide. Uh, one is a guide for NGOs on how to use Bitcoin. That's coming out this month um, that we've produced. It's awesome. And the other one is a research paper about uh, how to scale Bitcoin maybe in the future through, through something called the validity roll-up. I'm going to Tennessee in a few weeks to speak at the, the Bitcoiner meetup in Nashville. I'll be at Bitcoin Amsterdam. I'll be speaking about Bitcoin at the Thomson Reuters conference in London. I'll be in New York City at the Atlas event. I'll be in Bangalore, India, speaking about Bitcoin. I will also be in Accra, Ghana uh, at the Africa Bitcoin conference. So the next few months are going to be a wild ride of educating, learning, you know, being present seeing old friends, meeting new faces. It's going to be a blast. So we're trying to stay as busy as possible. Planning the next big summit in Norway for next June. Dates should be finalized shortly. And no, we've got a lot. We're cooking up a lot. I just did a big piece. Uh, my latest essay was on Fediments and whether or not they could potentially help scale Bitcoin to the world. So I'll be doing more writing this fall as well. Wow. 
That's uh, amazing. And I, I'll be at the at the Freedom Forum event in New York. And I'm also going to be at the Norway one. I wouldn't miss those. We're going to put links to everything you just mentioned, Alex, or whatever it is linkable. We're going to put it down so people can check it out. Where can people learn more about yourself? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Gladstein. My DMs are open. I check them. Please write if you have questions. You can also go to href.org. I also have a lot of my own work at alexgladstein.com. So yeah, hey, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. When people around the world are able to control their own money without the interference of authoritarian governments, they are closer to realizing the human rights that were promised back in 1948. Through the Oslo Freedom Forum and his world travels, Alex has seen how Bitcoin can bring financial and even physical freedom to those who otherwise wouldn't have it. By supporting activists and Bitcoin development through the Human Rights Foundation, and by sharing people's stories through his work, lectures, and writing, Alex is helping to create a new system that expands freedom and human rights to everyone. As you heard from Alex, the system, Bitcoin, is already helping people all over the world, as I witnessed firsthand in Venezuela. Bitcoin puts money back in the hands of the individual, where they are free to choose. And more people are finding it every day. This is what inspires me to learn more, share more, and do more for this special community that has given me so much. All the links, books, and resources that we mentioned during the episode are available in the show notes. And I want to give a huge thank you to Alex for joining me. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this Because of Bitcoin episode, I would be very grateful for the five seconds it would take you to drop us a review and give us a rating on your favorite podcasting platform. This will really help us reach even more listeners. And if you'd like to learn more about Bitcoin, be sure to check out our newsletter by subscribing at ledn.io. That's ledn.io. Again, this was Mauricio Di Bartolomeo. Stay tuned for our next episode. And until then, muchas gracias y los quiero mucho. Chao, chao.